Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeads, and today we'll be covering topic 6.6, .6, which is nuclear energy. Our objectives for today are to be able to describe the use of nuclear energy as an electricity source, but also to describe the environmental effects of nuclear energy. The skill that we'll practice at the end of today's video is explaining relationships between different characteristics of environmental processes in a visual setting. So the first topic we'll talk about today is nuclear fission and radioactivity. So in nuclear fission, we fire a neutron at the nucleus of a radioactive isotope. So this is an element such as uranium or plutonium that has a really unstable nucleus that's prone to breaking apart. And when it breaks apart, it releases tons and tons of energy. So this is going to be the energy source, uh, which is released as heat, which we can then use to create electricity. Also, when that nucleus breaks apart, it releases more neutrons that go and hit more nuclei and break them apart, releasing more energy and releasing more neutrons that continue this process on in a big chain reaction. So if we look at a diagram of this to help us understand what's going on here, we can see this initial neutron flying in hits this nucleus that breaks the nucleus apart, which releases a lot of energy, but it also releases more neutrons. So these neutrons fly out, they hit other nuclei, break them apart, releasing more energy and more nuclei, or excuse me, more neutrons, they hit more nuclei, and so we have a chain reaction and we have tons and tons of energy being generated. And so we should also though look at what radioactivity is. So radioactivity is this idea that energy is given off by the breakdown of the nucleus of unstable isotopes. So again, to be radioactive as an element means that your nucleus is unstable and it will break down or decay and give off a lot of energy in the process. Now it's important also to point out that this happens even without nuclear fission. So radioactive elements naturally break down and release energy from their nuclei. Uh, and we can understand how long this takes by looking at the half-life. So the half-life is basically the time that it takes for half of a sample of a radioactive element, again, such as uranium or plutonium, to decay. And by decay, we mean for the nucleus to break down and give off you know, uh, neutrons and energy into the surrounding environment. If we look at this graph, we can kind of visualize this with the element cobalt. And so element, uh, the element of cobalt has an isotope cobalt 60. And if we look at this graph here, we can see that if we start with a 10 gram sample at a given point in time, after one half-life, there'll be five grams remaining. Now we know that a half-life for cobalt 60 is 5.27 years. So that means after 5.27 years, this 10 gram sample of cobalt 60 has decayed or broken down to a five gram sample. In another 5.27 years, it will decay further to a 2.5 gram sample. And so again, using the half-life, we can calculate at any given point in time, how much of a radioactive isotope is left. Now we'll take a look at how electricity is generated using nuclear power. So the steps are similar to fossil fuel, but we're just using uranium fission at the beginning to generate that heat rather than combusting a fossil fuel. And so as a reminder, we have the same process. We're generating heat, again, this time by nuclear fission. That heat will be used to turn water into steam. That steam will be forced past a turbine, which will spin. The turbine will power a generator, which will transform that mechanical or that kinetic energy into electricity. One thing I want to point out here is that uranium-235 is the most common isotope used for nuclear power generation. And so it's stored in these fuel rods. So basically we cram rods uh, full of uranium-235 and then we submerge them in water in a reactor core. And this is where the fission is going to occur. And so if we look at this diagram here, we can understand a little bit better what this looks like. So here's our reactor core, uh, and this will be where the fuel rods are stored. So the fission is occurring here. We're gonna pump it in water past the core and the reaction will uh, generate a ton of heat. So that will now produce super hot water that can actually be turned into steam that will turn the turbine, which will power the electric generator to create electricity. And then we can reuse that water so that steam can be allowed to condense. And then in a cooling tower, some of it will evaporate. So it's gonna give off water vapor, but then some of it will cool and condense back into liquid that we can cycle back through and use again. Because we're working with radioactive elements here and there's so much energy being produced, there's a couple safety measures uh, that go with nuclear power generation that we need to talk about. So first, if we look at the reactor core here, again, this is gonna be where the fission is actually taking place. We have some control rods. 
So these are rods that can be lowered down into the core and absorb excess neutrons that are flying around, which can allow us to control the speed of the reaction. By absorbing some of those extra neutrons, we slow the reaction down and basically keep a handle on it. We also have this submerged in water and we have a pump that's gonna send cool water in that can slow the reaction down as well by absorbing some of that heat that's created. And then finally, we have a nuclear reactor and this is a giant, often uh, concrete structure that's gonna have super, super thick walls to try to contain any radioactivity that may be given off in the process. And so these are some important safety features that can help out with avoiding a nuclear meltdown or the release of radioactivity. Next, we'll look at why nuclear energy is considered a cleaner alternative than fossil fuels, but why it's also a non-renewable energy source. So it's non-renewable because the fuel source, in this case, radioactive elements like uranium or plutonium are limited. Uh, they exist in finite qualities on earth and they will run out eventually. One reason that we consider nuclear to be cleaner as an energy production source than fossil fuels is because there are no air pollutants released at the point of electricity generation. So that's important to point out. Uh, the mining process and the construction of the power plant does release carbon dioxide, but when we actually generate the electricity, there are no air pollutants released. Notice that I use the term air pollutants instead of air pollution, so we can be specific here. There's no particulate matter, no SOx or NOx, no carbon dioxide or methane released, again, when generating electricity. The only gas that is released is water vapor, which technically is a greenhouse gas. That's important. We need to understand that we do consider water a greenhouse gas. It does trap energy in, her, in Earth's atmosphere, and it does contribute to uh, the warming of the planet. But because water vapor cycles so quickly through the atmosphere, and because the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere is dependent on the temperature of the atmosphere, we don't consider it as uh, sort of critical as a greenhouse gas when we compare it to carbon dioxide and methane. Another environmental issue that we should be aware of is the possibility of a meltdown and radioactive contamination. And so one issue here is that radioactive contamination can cause genetic mutations, it can cause cancer, and so that's a real risk that comes with nuclear power generation. We also have the issue of spent fuel rods. Spent fuel rods are old fuel rods that are no longer productive, and they're still radioactive for millions and millions of years, and we don't have a great storage solution for them. And we put them into barrels here that are marked uh, and then oftentimes they're stored right on site in these giant lead lined containers that try to capture any radioactivity that may be given off. So that's one problem is we don't really have a great long term storage solution for spent fuel rods. We also have the issue of mine tailings. Mine tailings are going to be leftover rock and soil that oftentimes still contain radioactive materials. Sometimes they're stored in tailing ponds, as we can see here. And so there's going to be the risk that this might flood and, you know, carry radiation into the surrounding environment. Then we also have water use. Nuclear power generators require lots and lots of water uh, to create all of that steam, to turn the turbine, but also to cool down the reactor. And then another issue that goes with water consumption is thermal pollution. So the water that's produced in this process is gonna be really, really hot. The wastewater, uh, the steam that condenses back into water in the cooling towers is extremely hot. Oftentimes it's released into local bodies of water as we can see in this picture here. And if we look at some thermal imaging, we can see how much hotter the water coming from a nuclear power plant is than the surrounding environment. So this is a problem because it can cause thermal shock. Thermal shock is when the oxygen levels in water drop suddenly because warm water holds less oxygen. And that can lead to fish die-offs or die-offs in any aquatic organisms that require oxygen. And finally, we'll wrap up today by talking about some notable nuclear meltdowns in history along with their environmental consequences. So the three that we should be aware of in apes are Three Mile Island, which was in the United States, uh, Fukushima, which is in Japan, and Chernobyl, which is in Ukraine. So in Three Mile Island, uh, this was in the United States in 1979, it was a partial meltdown due to uh, some testing error and a valve that did not open and bring in cool water. Uh, there were no deaths in this incident, but there was detectable radiation released. Uh, now, follow-up studies by scientists have not detected increased cancer rates in the area, uh, so some of the fears that came with Three Mile Island uh, have been uh, partially unfounded. But what's important to note about Three Mile Island is it did scare the American public. And so there have been no new nuclear plants built in the United States since 1979. So this was a significant incident still. Fukushima, Japan, on the other hand, was a full meltdown. So there was an earthquake uh, that triggered a tsunami. 
and this caused the electricity to fail. And the backup generators were not able to get the cooling pumps on in time. So the reaction core overheated. Uh, it was a full meltdown. So there was an explosion and the containment chamber was breached and radioac uh, radioactivity was released into the surrounding environment, both in the ocean and into the air. And then in Chernobyl, uh, this was also a case where a cooling valve was stuck uh, during a test of the plant and that led to a complete meltdown. So there were also explosions, containment uh, structures were breached and a lot of radioactivity was released. So if we look at this diagram here, we can understand a little bit better how this actually occurs. In a normal setting, this cool water pump sends water in and that can help regulate the speed of the reaction in the core along with the control rods. However, in a meltdown, what often happens is the pump fails. So no cool water is coming in, the temperature accelerates and increases rapidly, and then it gets so hot that it basically melts through the containment structure, and we consider that a meltdown. So when it breaches the containment structure, that's when you're going to have radioactivity released. And so environmental consequences of these meltdowns are, of course, that radioactivity is released. Radioactivity uh, that's given off from this reaction can cause genetic mutations in humans, animals, and plants in the surrounding area. Uh, it can lead to cancer potentially down the road. And so this is a big environmental consequence. We can also have soil contamination. So the radioactive uh, elements that are given off, they can get into the soil and they can contaminate the soil for years and years down the road and cause genetic mutations in plants and animals. And then finally, we have the possibility of widespread radiation being carried by the wind. Uh, and this occurred in Chernobyl. So when the Chernobyl explosion happened, the wind actually dispersed radioactive particles over long distances. If we look at this map here, we can see here's the uh, center basically of the meltdown at uh, Chernobyl. And then on the graph, we can see 40 to 100 doses beyond the expected background rate. So everybody gets some background rate of radiation every year, uh, just from cosmic radiation, environmental radiation, and, and human radiation. Um, but the zone closest to Chernobyl here received 40 to 100 times that expected background radiation. And then we can see as we get further out, you know, 10 to 20, 5 to 10. And so even people hundreds of miles away from the explosion were receiving radiation far higher than the level we would expect them to had the explosion not occurred. So our practice FRQ for topic 6.6 .6 today will be taking a look at this diagram and identifying and describing one letter of the diagram that is common to both fossil fuel and nuclear electricity production. And then a second FRQ is to identify one letter in the diagram that is found only in nuclear power generation. Make sure to describe both of these features of the diagram.